Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Big Apple's Core podcast. I'm your host, Kayla Harris with BGIS, a global leader in facilities and real estate management. Today, our guests are Mindy Williams, director with Turner and Townsend, and Marcus Rayner, vice chair with Colliers. So to further introduce our guest today, Mindy Williams is a director at Turner and Townsend, an independent professional services company that specializes in program management, project management, and cost management services. She has over 25 years of experience working in partnership with the real estate, design, and construction industries. Mindy is extremely involved in several organizations. She is the current vice president of New York City chapter of Cornet Global Services. She's also actively involved with several charitable organizations serving as the co-chair of the Special Olympics New York Real Estate and Construction Gala and is a member of the Courage and Sacrifice Golf Committee supporting combat veterans. Welcome, Mindy. Marcus is vice chair of New York with more than 30 years of real estate experience and is a recognized leader in our industry. He specializes in representing occupiers and providers, providing clients with integrated services at local, national, and global levels. Marcus is also Cornet Global board member. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you. So today our discussions will be around building and maintaining strong relationships in the corporate real estate industry. Uh, with our two industry leaders, I'm looking forward to learning a lot of tips about how were you to have experience building relationships, but also hearing some stories on where you've also experienced some, experienced some challenges. So let's get right into it. Mindy, I'll um, begin with you. Uh, what, what do relationships in corporate real estate mean to our industry? It was a good call going to me first versus Marcus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that, I think relationships wildly differ depending on, on who you ask. Um, you know, I think that there are different types of relationships, and I think that the relationships that Marcus and I are here to talk about are going to be more long-term, long-standing, deep-rooted, genuine relationships versus transactional relationships. So I think that I wanted to clarify that there are multiple different types of relationships, and, and the types of relationships that we build in our industry are vitally important to maintaining long-standing, committed relationships with our clients, with our colleagues, with our families and friends as well. So I think that the the core basics of building relationships, no matter where you are, whether business or personal, kind of remain the same. So I think that they're wildly important in, in business and personal life. Yeah, I think I would agree with that, uh, Kayla. I mean, relationships are the key to success in any business, but in an industry as messy as corporate real estate, they're essential. Um, real estate is messy because it involves many different skill sets. So if you don't have a relationship with those skill sets, you can't communicate solutions to problems. And I think relations are also, I Mindy mean, was just referring to this, are about creating trust, uh, first and foremost. And expertise is something that you have to have um, uh, as an essential, obviously. But more than that, it's about consistently doing the right thing. And that is not just a node to Spike Lee. It's actually the founding principle of Bill Goad, who was the chairman of Cressa Partners, who unfortunately passed away this week. Wow. Old friend, mentor, Bill, message to you. All right. Well, on that note, um, what skills do you think that you bring to the table uh, when building relationships and... Can you list a few tips that you think that um, you know someone could use and take away? Sure. Um, I think these fall into three categories. I mean, first and foremost, you have to have reliable expertise. I think you, so you have to have an expertise in some part of our business, and you have to be someone that your client or customer can actually rely on. And that means you must have knowledge that you uh, about that can actually help. You must also recognize when you don't have the knowledge to be able to help, and you must know where to go get that knowledge. Um, the next two, I think, are really two key social skills. 
Um, one is empathy, which I actually believe is rather part of your DNA. You're actually either born with that or not. But um, the in my and what that means to people that are not that familiar with it, if you're starting out in your career, it's putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And I have a little bit of a history of having perhaps been born with that, but also acquired it through my acting uh, escapades over, over the years. That's a, that's the subject of another po podcast. But that's we, putting we might have some, some more time. Oh, we might need to yeah. get into that. We'll unpack that, that later. So <laughs> we, 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 can do, we can certainly do that later. The second one is listening, which too many people in sales confuse with talking. So listening is really asking yourself the question, how can I help? What do I need to know? And for your listeners, there was a book produced that I learned a lot from a couple of decades ago, but maybe more than that, the, uh, by a fellow called David Meister, who is the authority on how to manage professional service firms. And in that book, he has a, a chapter which, which talks about how clients choose. And so for all of you who are thinking about what do I need to listen for, how do I need to respond, that book is absolutely wonderful at, at actually addressing that. And the last one is really communication which I think is, is be fast becoming the most important skill set that real estate people can have. Um, so in an era of um, endless data and the fog of algorithmic solutions, you need to be a voice of calm in all that and a voice of reason. So communication skills are really important. Um, two examples that I actually love is one is that Steve Schwartzman uh, once told a group of students that it was the most important skill he looked for in hiring. And they asked him why. And he said, I'm extremely fortunate. I can afford to hire any expert at any price anywhere in the world. What I can't do is find the person that can distill those opinions into a single page so that I can communicate with boards of directors, shareholders, and even my managers and partners. And the other example, I think, which is very relevant for Cornet, which Mindy will appreciate, is if you talk to Sarah Abrahams of Iron Mountain, who I think is who I admire hugely, she will tell you that the ability to tell stories is a key communication in real estate. And I think she's absolutely right, and it's something I work on really, really hard. Wow. That's a good one. Thank you for those tips. To add on to what Marcus was just saying, um, for me, the two biggest traits are authenticity. Um, I feel that it was important to bring my full, true self to any relationship. Um, I had a mentor who had said to me, you know, she gave me permission to be my true, authentic self. And I remember when I first got into the business, um, I had someone say to me, and I don't think it was meant in a mean way, but I kind of took it as a oof. Um, she had said to me, you know, you can't build a business or build a career on being a good time party girl. And I'm like, wow, okay, well, um, so I, was, I w went to my next role and I was like, okay, I need to be more professional and more serious and I'm going to be serious, Mindy. And I, I just felt disconnected from who I really wanted to be and because I felt disconnected, people could not truly authentically connect with me because I wasn't giving them my full self. Um, and, the, and they felt that I was not giving them all of me and I was holding something back and it created a distrust because what was it that I was holding back? Why did I not trust them enough to give them all of me? So she gave me permission to be my true authentic self in business and I think that that helped me create true, authentic relationships. So people, you know, I, I tease about having personalities that are like cilantro. You either <laughs> love me or you hate me. There's really no in between. Um, but once I, once I received the permission to be my true self, it really helped open up those relationships. The other thing is, you know, not every, I, I don't speak everyone's language, but I think being multilingual is important. And by, by that, I don't mean Spanish and French and, and Chinese. I mean understanding the language of people. And some people understand um, sensitive, true, sincere conversations, and that's where they connect. Others connect through a sense of humor, um, you, know, you know, just being a little sarcastic. And that's where certain connections are formed. So being able to speak multiple languages in that regard, I think, has helped me build true relationships. 
because not everyone speaks exactly the same language, so it's important for me to be able or to put myself out there to try to speak theirs. It's exactly the reason, actually, why sometimes I cannot understand a word Mindy is to say. <laughs> <laughs> now I finally understand. <laughs> Mindy. I speak Mandarin, and Marcus <laughs> speaks, uh, what is that language Eng you speak? English, it's English. <laughs> it's, it's, it's recognized, recognized language as well. You know? I, really, um, I really enjoy those points, and I think that um, when you're maybe in the corporate setting, you think that there's a, a certain way you have to speak or look and act. Um, so just you, you're, the point that you brought up about being your authentic self, I think that could be, um, you know, a, a fear that many people experience, just, you know, knowing when to be themselves or, or getting the, the permission to be themselves in certain situations and feeling comfortable. Um, so I like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then how do you, uh, how have you differentiated yourself in this market? I'll, uh, you want me I'll, to go first on yeah, this Yeah, you, you gave him the, the look. Oh, indeed, I, indeed, I was say, indeed I say that I'm British. That, that, that doesn't help. It means I've never mastered an American accent, which is, is terrible. It means I'm at fault. Um, I have a different training. So I was trained as a chartered surveyor, which is a UK and global qualification, except in, the, in, the, in America, which is quite extraordinary. Um, but I still think, after all these years, it's probably the best basic ground training in, in commercial real estate you can possibly get, all residential. So that's probably one differentiator. What that means is I'm generally looking, I'm able to look at the big picture as opposed to just myopically at the issue that, 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 that may be at hand, which I find quite useful. Um, and the other thing I think is just um, being inquisitive. So again, this is a learned experience from clients. I actually learnt it uh, most acutely from Amazon. When Amazon used to say to you all the time, we want to look around corners. And they weren't telling me that as something just to tell me. They said that's what we tell one another uh, inside, inside the organization. And it was a great lesson on thinking ahead, finding out what you don't know. If you don't know, you better go and get educated and you better try and help the client think about what's coming up next. And I've never lost that. And I am generally, I think, quite an inquisitive person. Wow. And so you've carried that through each position? Yeah, we've done mad hat things like, so who on earth in the middle of COVID decides to put on a program about augmented reality? I did because I saw a, it was something a little bit different. And I see it as an influence on corporate real estate in the next five to ten years. Massive influence. I didn't understand it. I got a whiff of that it might be relevant to, to clients. I started experimenting with that, realized where, where they were, thought it was, yes, a relevant issue, found the expert, and I now know how relevant that is and how it might apply to, to really major corporate decisions. And Mindy, what about you? So I'm gonna back that up a little bit. So I am, um, it's not as obvious as Marcus, um, but I am not a, a New Yorker and I was not born and raised in New York. I was born and raised in the South, um, and growing up in the South and being a female, they, they like to put you in a box and they have certain expectations of a female growing up in the South. And I never felt like I fit in there. So I came to New York for the first time to visit my dad and realized that not a single person in this city fit in, and they didn't care. So, so I was like, this is my home. These are my people. Um, and I think that one of the things that New York did for me is it gave me confidence to be myself because I never wanted to conform and fit in because in my heart I knew that I was meant to stand out. And this city and this industry um, allowed me to do that. And I have never felt like I had to apologize for who I am or what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do it. Uh, I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to, to be in this particular industry. When I first got into it, people were like, oh, wow, that's, mm, that's a tough industry. And, and for a female, how do you feel about being in the, construct, the real estate and construction industry as a female? And I'm like, why wouldn't I love it? They're like, oh, it's a bunch of men. And I go, makes me stand out. Perfect. You know, why would you want to talk to another guy in the room when there's one female in the room? Wouldn't you rather talk to the 
the female in the room. <laughs> so, and that was that was the other thing is that you know you have to you have to be able to identify the the gifts that you have and the things that make you stand out and leverage those. And I think that um, this city and this industry allows you to do just exactly that. And if you don't, if you try to do it like everyone else, you're going to fail because there's only one you and there's only one them. So you have to be able to find your own way and do it your own way. Definitely. And um, what about ways that, you know, someone can start branching off and, and finding their own way? Is it, you know, through, you know, joining groups like Cornet or um, other, other groups? I will say I'm going to go back to something that, that Marcus said, and I, I feel that um, you have to be curious. You have to have a thirst for knowledge and a, and a, and a desire to want to expand your experiences. Um, and in order to do that, you have to have a, a little bit of bravery and courage in order to do that because it's scary when you step outside of your comfort zone. And it's scary when you get an assignment that you're not in your, in your zone of expertise. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respectfully disagree with um, Marcus when he said you have to be knowledgeable or an expert in something because I'm an expert in nothing. <laughs> so, but I've been able to, to make a living out of being an expert at nothing. But the reason for that is because I have a curiosity to learn about so much. So I don't, wanna, I don't want to be an expert in this area or that area. I want to know it all. Um, so it which which makes me um, a pain in the in the rear end sometimes because I ask a lot of questions like a two year old and my favorite question is why, <laughs> um, but I think I think to to Marcus's point there has to be a curiosity and you have to be willing to kind of chase down the answers. Um, I think that's kind of where you were going with what you were saying with the the curiosity. Yes, yes, it was. I, th I think it is. Um, what builds a relationship and if it's trust which i think we both agree on how do you build trust with somebody you don't know the last thing you do is walk come into cornet and try and sell something to <laughs> what you end we've up doing there. yeah we've been <laughs> doing that you come in you roll up your sleeves you get on a committee and you learn to collaborate what does that do it shows if this is your potential client you're collaborating with what you're like to work with how honestly you actually address an issue do you follow up do you complete the exercise are you open to ideas? Can you, can you work with, with other people? It shows your, your potential client everything they ever need to, to, to see about you. So getting involved with an organization like Cornet is essential. That's the first and foremost. It isn't about social media. Social media is in support of that. Once you're recognized for the skills that you have, um, people will find you on social media and you have to be active on social media. Mindy does twice as good a job as I do on this. I couldn't possibly compete. Not but just social media, but well, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> but she does it. What I'm saying is, she does it extremely well. I don't do it that well. I have a lot of people that I'm connected to. She's so she's so difficult. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of people that, I, that I'm that I'm connected to, but I don't post in the in the way that she does. And I think she does a very good job in that area. Coronet has been a unique experience for me because when I came to New York, I didn't have a network. Um, my network were, were the people that sat in my office and that is a very small nucleus and I, I knew that I wanted like I said to learn and expand and and see what else was out there I mean you don't come from a small town in, in Georgia and find yourself plant yourself in the middle of the, one of the biggest cities in the world if you want a small world and a small network um, so Cornet has afforded me uh, the opportunity to meet so many different people in, in who travel and, and network in different areas that I would never have access to, um, and I started when I started at, uh, when I first joined Cornet. I was so new in my career that I, I I needed to belong to something, and then I realized that I wasn't doing it just for business purposes. I really liked the people that I met in this organization, and I realized that I had so many things in common with a lot of these people beyond just our industry and beyond our day jobs. And I came to New York with no friends and I, it's blossomed into hundreds of people that I call friends. And some of them like started off as a, as a professional relationship but has just turned into personal relationships where we spend our personal times, our our off hours, our weekends together. So I think that that, 
that's really important because I wouldn't have the group of friends, the diverse group of friends without an organization like Cornet. I think the, just a couple of other aspects of this. If you're a young person trying to get into our industry and grow your network, when you go to events, do not go and talk to the people that you already know. Take a chance, whether it's at a core night conference or somewhere else, and go and talk to somebody you don't know. And I'm going to give you a wonderful example of, of how this, this happened for me. <laughs> years and years ago, I happened to be get a very late ticket to what was then, I think, the largest luncheon ever organized in New York for Margaret Thatcher. So, so many people wanted tickets. I couldn't get a ticket. But eventually, I got one, and I was at the back of the room, and I sat down at this table. I didn't know anybody at the table, but I happened to be sitting next to the head of a global luxury brand and he and I started talking and we got on extremely well he was also English and he said uh, do you know anything about leases and I said yeah I know, I know a little bit about leases and he said we've got this tiny little office that we've got above our, our retail flagship and they've got some storage space and I just need somebody to have a look at you would you mind having a look at it and I said no of course of course not and when I say small it was extremely small but five years later we ended up doing the largest trans retail transaction ever done on Fifth Avenue, partly because of the size of the actual, the actual uh, piece of space that we were taking and the length of the lease and the market rents uh, at the time. So that's an example of taking a chance, going to an event, striking up a relationship with somebody I didn't know. Still today, that person is a very good friend and client, but it blossomed into something great. But it took time. So be yeah. patient. It's, you're not going to hit on your first go around right, and you right. might have to attend uh, a few of those before you actually get comfortable and come out of your shell and yeah. well like like big transactions i always say mindy laughed right when we were having a chat about this all major transactions nearly fail i think at least twice is is, is what's happened in my career all of them have nearly nearly failed twice and the, po the point is, you have to keep going. So you go to an event and you try to build a relationship. Don't get put off if you come away from one event and you don't have the results. Keep pushing, keep finding, keep, keep talking to somebody else. And eventually you'll get the success that your, your efforts deserve. And some people might say, oh God, you and, you and Marcus are different because you're in a sales role. You know, I've always been in a sales role, Marcus is in a sales role. So there's an expectation that salespeople have to be uh, extroverted or aggressive, and I, I I debate that all the time because, you know. So I, do I. I'm a lot more sensitive than Mindy. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would second that comment. I, I, I <laughs> he's quite sensitive, uh, but I, I feel like you know there are there are multiple opportunities to get to know people, and if you come to industry events, and your sole purpose is to put your card in someone's hand, that's transactional. And that's, that's not why we do what we do. I think, you know, I, I don't want to put words in Marcus's mouth, but we don't look for a transaction. We look for a relationship. And there will be plenty of time for people to ask, well, what do you do? Tell me more about what it is that you do. Um, tell me more about your company. Tell me more about you. But, I mean, you never, you never go on a first date and talk about yourself for the entire time and go, that was the best date I ever had. <laughs> well, tell me about your date. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know. So you kind of have to go into some of these events or these industry events with that same mentality where you need to learn about the people that are in that room. You can talk about yourself later. Um, and to your point, I always liked the, the wallflowers. I would go into the room and immediately see someone who was very uncomfortable looking back against the wall just with the deer in the headlight look. Um, and I would walk over and introduce myself to them because they obviously didn't know anyone in the room and I felt like at a certain point in my career I pretty much knew everyone there and to your point I didn't want to go and talk to the people I already knew because I already knew them the my my agenda was to go in and meet new people and that person looked like they needed a wingman so or a wing person so I went in and introduced myself and I have to say that um, I've developed relationships and clients by just going to the wallflower and and some of these long-standing relationships have been through putting yourself, putting yourself in a vulnerable position to go and talk to someone. I have one question, actually, Mindy. Was I one of those wallflowers? Have you ever been accused of being a wallflower? <laughs> no. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mindy, to go back to um, a point you touched on about you know relationships being transactional and just giving someone your card, 
Um, what about when you, you know, maybe some, that's someone's approach. Um, how can you, I guess, share tips on how people follow up? If you do, you know, if you do uh, meet someone and you do exchange business cards, is it on them to follow up the next day? And, and how does one do that? Do, do they do it via email? Do they just show up at their door? Where do you? Uh... I feel like that depends. It depends on the situation. Um, it depends on how the interaction went. Um, if, you, if you go in with no expectation, into a conversation, I think you walk away winning almost every time. You get to know someone, or you may say, wow, that was, a, I dodged that bullet there. <laughs> so you don't know if you want to do business with a person until you have a conversation with them. Um, and then if they ask you, what is your name? What is your company? What do you do? Then they're, they're taking an interest in you. And then you take that conversation and just follow it naturally. And then you could say, I'd really like to follow up with you after. I don't want to monopolize your time here at this event, but I'd love to maybe follow up for a cup of coffee or just a, a chat on the phone because I'd really like to get to know you better. And then I kind of treat it, again, I keep talking about dating. My husband's going to be mad at me when he hears <laughs> this. Um, but you, you think of it like when you're dating, you don't call someone as soon as you get home. You know, yeah. after a date, you, or give maybe it a, you, did. you give it, <laughs> <laughs> you give it a little bit of time. You let it breathe a little, and then you call them a couple of days later and say, "Hey, I just I really enjoyed meeting you, and I wanted to follow up and and let you know that I really enjoyed our conversation." Let them know that you heard what they said. So drop that little detail into the follow up, whether it's a voicemail or whether it's a phone call um, or an email, and let it go from there. And then. God forbid they don't answer you within five minutes. Give them a breather because they could be, you know, dealing with the, the biggest emergency in their work life or personal life. So allow them to, to follow up with you as well. Uh, another way, not quite so direct. Mindy is very, very good at this. So another way, which is somebody who's a little more, uh, who's a little shyer in, in that sense, a little more introverted. Um, Always look, it's the same thing that Mindy's saying, but look for a way in which you can help the person you were talking to. Find out what they, you will have done enough questioning, hopefully, and talking to them that they're interested in talking to you again, but you'll find something common that you can add a bit of intelligence to. Give them an, give them an example. Give them some help with something. Do that first. Show them that that's what you're capable of doing before asking for the, for the rest of it. 100% agree with that. Okay, it's it's a, it's. I think it's exactly what you were saying. But there are some people who won't do enough asking. It's always the criticism of all people who are not successful salespeople. But some people like to sell in a different way. And relationship building is a very, I think, a complicated form of selling. Um, you have to be very careful. And your reputation is everything. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you've started out on a relationship just as if you were dating, saying. <laughs> Uh, I want you to trust me. How do I demonstrate my trust? And you're doing that. You're probably going to have more success at building a, a corporate. And it takes a lifetime to build a, re a, a reputation, to build a good reputation. It takes five minutes or less to destroy it. So, I mean, all of that work that you've done to, to be taken seriously, to be trusted, Remember that in every interaction, in every engagement, because it's that one time, that one slip up that people will remember. So it's important to kind of always be mindful of that. Definitely. So it's not just, you know, building those strong relationships, but maintaining those. And, you know, so it's, I guess, being conscious in, in every interaction, in every room of, you know, I've, you know, I've been able to achieve this relationship or, or and how do I maintain it? Yeah. Well, how do you know whether your relationship is successful? Oh, that's a good question. It's very simple. Someone answers your phone call, they don't. No, 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 <laughs> wrong way around. The answer to that question is that the client, you are the first person the client calls about that problem. Yeah. Or they could call you about something that you don't solve. Exactly. They're like, so I know that I have you know, this issue, and I know that you're, you're a broker and you handle transactions, but I know that you might know someone who knows this or knows about this. Good point. Yeah. Needn't be in your, it needn't even be in your direct area. They're trusting you. Maybe they've got a boss who's asked them a question they can't answer. They've got one call to make. 
to set the boss's mind at ease, just to say, I'm going to be able to deal with this and this is how I'm going to do it. They, don't ha they may feel it's not just one expert, it's about four or five. Who do I call to find out what I'm missing? My what lifeline. I'm, right. Who's well, Marcus. Uh, right. My phone right, a friend. Okay. <laughs> who's not going to let me say the wrong thing? Yeah. That's a good relationship. Definitely. Do you agree? I do. I 100% agree with that. So, so uh, how on earth did Mindy and I get to work together? I mean, that's the, <laughs> ex ex <laughs> the obvious question. <laughs> well, I, I'd also be curious to um, hear some stories that you two have of successful relationships that you've built or unsuccessful relationships. So I know that you've mentioned, you know, ways to go about building and maintaining good relationships, but have you experienced a time where, man, you, you messed this up? And uh, so obviously learning from your mistakes, so. Have you had uh, any challenges? I Yes, a, a lifetime and a, a <laughs> career full of challenges. Which one do I pick? <laughs> um, I'll start with, with one in particular. Th there was a client that I had. It was one of my very first clients um, when I started off in the industry um, on the furniture side. And I've had, I've, I've had a couple of different careers um, where I've sat in different seats. So I went from furniture to architecture to construction to now the owner's rep side. So st always within the same industry, but just a different perspective. And no matter where I went, what company I went to, that client followed me at every single one of my companies. And it was because he trusted me. He knew that I would always have his best interest at hand. Um, and what created that situation was we were in the trenches. We were working on an absolute dog of a project. And every problem, every challenge, you name it, we were dealing with it. Um, and it was, it was not a good time. Um, and he, he came to me and was like, you know what? Let's just, I'm just going to buy this from you. And I'm like, no, you're not, because we're not the best at that. And I, I would highly suggest you go to my competitor for this particular service or this particular pro product because you're going to be disappointed in what I'm going to deliver to you because that's what I have to offer you and it's not the right solution. Um, and he thought that he was being loyal. He's like, nope, I'm going to buy it from you. And he did and he was wildly disappointed <laughs> with the outcome. And, uh, but we still made it good. And I said, okay, now will you listen to me and speak to my competitor? I will set up the conversation or the meeting because they do this particular thing better than we do. And he was very grateful for that. Never, never, he was never disloyal. So he would say, is it okay if I go to someone else? Absolutely, yes, because, it, or I'd say, no, I do that better. <laughs> but he, there was a trust built because of the honesty. Um, and on the flip side, there was a situation where I was not allowed to be honest with a client. Um, and, and it really backfired, um, where the client came back to me and said, what the heck? I mean, I thought that we had a, a, a relationship where we could be honest with each other, and I feel like you were not being honest with me. And it wasn't that I lied directly, it was I just did not tell him the full truth because I wasn't allowed to. Um, and that was a big lesson learned. And sometimes um, I think you have to make a decision in your career um, where your morality lies so that sometimes you're put in a really difficult position between the people who pay you and the people who pay you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to, you have to figure out um, where your moral compass is and, and stay true to that. Yeah, I think it's... I think problems with relationships come from the same source. So the, the easiest way to say it is people take relationships for granted. The example might be you've done a job for a client and it went so well, you just think they're always going to, to, to retain you. Not true. They may have a different boss. They may have a different procurement process. They may have different people on the team. And you all have to start from square one. So that's, that's rule number one. Don't take it for granted. I think rule number two, and we have all done that in some form, we either haven't followed up or we haven't uh, uh, recognized the strength of the relationship was ebbing or we didn't realize there was a promotion internally which put the person you had a contact with not in the place they used to be. That happens to all of us. Some of that you can do something about, something you can't. The other thing is 
you really do have to be careful these days that you're not making mistakes. Mistakes are the easiest way to, for a client to go and talk to somebody else. So that if you ask me, what do I get paranoid about? It's about mistakes. I don't mind if the client makes a dis different, different decision because they don't like the advice or they don't like the way we did something, but there should never be a mistake. And I think if you do that, you'll be surprised by clients will forgive you if they don't like the advice, but subsequently maybe find out it probably was the right advice at the time. Mm -hmm. And they know you didn't make a mistake. You didn't put them in a position where they'd have something to answer for that was unseen. So, and there are, there are myriad, it's not a question of a mentioning a client or whatever, there are myriad of w ways in which those things happen and they're gray. Uh, Mindy was referring to this actually. They're not always straightforward, they're gray. You can't always say this is definitive. I mean, again, my old boss at uh, uh, Cressa, the founder of Cressa used to say, do the right thing, always do something in the client's interest, which I always thought was pretty good, simple advice to keep out of trouble. So you'd have to go to your client and say, look, this is what, you've asked me to do this, this is what it's telling me, but I think if you do that, you're gonna find out X and it's gonna be a problem. And sometimes you have to be able to stand up and say that, and sometimes you're gonna get yelled at by the client or they're not gonna appreciate it. But they may come back. This happened to me in one negotiation, which I, um, I cannot disclose what it was. It was an across the table dis discussion with a major landlord and the landlord was pushing my client who was at the table to agree things that I didn't think were right. And I said, you can't, in the end, I said, you can't agree that. And the client said, for goodness sake, will you be quiet? And just, th so shut, shut me down. And then two minutes later I said, excuse me, I need to have five minutes. So he went outside and he said, Marcus, what is going on? So I then explained the issue to him and I said, if you give up that, you're giving up this, 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 and this. And this is, what's the consequence? I said, this is the consequence. This is what will happen, et cetera, et cetera. I said, you can do it. And I said, I'm certainly not going to argue with you in front of the client, but if you do it, this is the consequence. I just need you to know that's what you're giving up. He said, thank you. And after we'd finished the negotiation, he just said to me, I want to know that I appreciated you standing up and saying something when you did, even though it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So I kept the client. You know, there was a very wise man who once said to me, um, doing the right thing is rarely the easy thing. Yes. So you kind of have to have some, uh, some courage. Some conviction, sure yeah, you conviction. Do. Sure. It's so vitally important to have a relationship. Thank you, Mindy and Marcus, for the great discussion today. Um, and I want to thank you, Cornet listeners, for tuning in. Ha, 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 ha.